Well, without any further ado, would you join me in giving a very warm welcome to our fearless leader, Mr. Ron Dunn. Ron? All right, good morning. So growing up, how many channels did you have available to you? Three. Three? Three? Yeah, and I remember the fourth one came along. That was pretty cool. Think of the expansion today of what's happened between cable and, and satellite network, right? Whether you're in your car or whether you're at home, how many choices do we have? Rich has been able to watch replays of the Super Bowl every single day, probably on the hour, because there's stations that'll do that, right? We have news channels, we have sports channels, we have weather channels, we have history channel, we have natural geographic, shopping channels, you had comedy channels, there's all kinds, but you know, what, you know what's missing? A wisdom channel, <laughs> right? And why is that? Why do all these other channels exist? Because people want that, right? The question ha that we have to ask is how much do we really pursue wisdom? How much do, does mankind pursue wisdom? Insights on how to live the right way. One of the things that, that the Bible uh, encourages us to do is to look at wisdom as a very precious jewel more precious than gold, more precious than silver, more precious than anything, and chase it with all that we have. So today, as we continue this look into the life of Solomon, one of the core teachings of Solomon is that, to choose wisdom. And so we're going to look at his story, uh, pull out your going deeper uh, sheet, the new bifold. So in 1 Kings, David has died. Last week, we looked at when David called Solomon to his bedside and gave him some final words of, 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 of advice, this is how you can be successful. Listen to the precepts, follow the commands of God, pay attention to his word, and you'll be successful. And then David went on and told him some other things, just some real practical things. Here's some people I want you to take care of. They've been really good to us. They've supported the kingdom. Here's, make sure you take care of them. Here's somebody, Joab, you can't trust him, okay? I had him kind of on my watch. Not good for you, take him out. And then there's this guy that cursed me a while back. I promised God I wouldn't touch him. You're not bound by that covenant, take that guy out. <laughs> so he's helping his son to make sure that his kingdom can go on. And then Solomon dies, or I'm sorry, David dies, and Solomon's given the kingdom and he's in over his head, and, and he's feeling a little bit desperate, but we're told in 1 Kings 3, he loved God, he walked with God, and he worshiped God. And he gave a thousand burnt offerings in Gibeon. And then at Gibeon, uh, go, let's go ahead and look at the verse, it's 1 Kings 3, 5 through 9. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream and said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. <laughs> you have to pause and say, what would that be like if that, that, if that was given to us? If God came to you and said, ask whatever you want, what would be the next thing out of your mouth? For Solomon was, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David. First thing he says, so God says, ask. And Solomon says, thank you. Thank you for taking care of my dad. You treated him great. Thank you that now you've put me on the throne as he requested. So before Solomon goes forward and asking what he wants for tomorrow, he's thanking God for yesterday. It's a good practice for us, guys. As we pray, acknowledge. When God says, yes, come to me and ask, acknowledge him first. Then he says, now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in the place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. So Solomon comes to God in a spirit of absolute humility. He's in his 20s at this point. Probably 28 is, is the you know, most, as they chisel it down, it's 27, 28, somewhere in there. He's taken over and he comes to me and says, I am like a little kid. So humbleness. 
Then he says, your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or to number. So not only is he humble, he's also desperate. This job is big. I'm like a little kid, and this is a big job. Now, I propose to you, God loves this kind of conversation we have it with him. If we're seeking humility, if we start from a place where we love God, we walk with God, and we worship God, we're humble, and we're desperate, this is one of the reasons why, why God asked Solomon, what do you want? Because Solomon was in a perfect spot to now re receive what God wanted to give him, which was wisdom. And as we're going to see in a minute, he was about ready to give him more. So throughout the Bible, God honors the fact. In fact, he puts us in a spot where we will be desperate for him. Well, we'll come to him and as we start. We're coming from this position. I mean, think in the Bible, the first day that the Israelites left Egypt after 400 years in captivity. What happened on day one? They're backed up against the Red Sea. God put them in a spot where they had nowhere to go. He led them to that spot through Moses. Here comes Pharaoh with his armies. Pharaoh had a change of heart. He was going to take them out. And they had nowhere to go. And they, they're in desperation. And what does God do? Parts the sea. He lets them know that he's able. Gideon. Anybody watch the Eagles in the, in the interview afterwards? One of the players actually referred to Judges chapter 7. He said, read it. And he talked about this story, how God called Gideon because the Midianites were picking on the Israelites. And, and God finally said, okay, Gideon, get together an army. We're going to take them out. They're in the promised land. We're going to take them out. And so... Gideon calls, together, calls all the men together, 32,000 men. God says, it's too many. Tell some to go home. So Gideon said, whoever's afraid, go home. You know how many guys left? 22,000. <laughs> I'm not going to fight. He's down to 10,000. All right, we got 10,000 warriors. God says, it's still too many. And he sends them down to the river and says, whoever laps up water like in their hand and drinks it and pays attention with the sword, those are our guys. 300. Only 300. And the reason he wanted 300 to go against the thousands and thousands of Midianites is so that they could know this is God that did it. First day in the promised land, the walls of Jericho. How do they take it down? Nothing in their hands, no weapons, walk around a wall and make some noise. What God's underscoring is, yes, I'm going to put you in desperate situations, but I've got it. Rely on me, turn to me, seek me. So, uh, Walt Hendrickson, who was Gail's mentor, passes past year, he wrote this book, Thoughts from the Diary of a Desperate Man. And so, I, if, you have, if you don't have this book, I picked up 40 more copies. It's a great, great devotional. I, I don't know of a better devotional for men. Day, day by day, different topics, but it takes you deep in the word. Uh, go ahead and grab a copy if you like one. Our cost on them is 24 bucks. It's all leather. If you can reimburse us, great. If not, it's our gift to you, okay? But Seeking Wisdom. When I asked him how he came up with that title, because I did not get it, a guy in the plane asked me what's with that title when I was reading it. <laughs> and uh, he told me, that this is what he said, Ron, Men get to a point where we think we've got it. Solomon could easily just thought, I'm now king. I've got the position, I've got the power. But instead he said, this is too big for me. And so uh, Walt's question to me was, when you started your company and you were looking for a supplier and you're looking for stores and new members, where were you? On your knees desperate. Now, today, 20 years later, am I still that desperate? Or do I think, I got it, because we've arrived. Where God wants us, as we're seeking wisdom, to be desperate for him. All right, so look at what the next, the next uh, comment that he makes down. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and distinguish between right and wrong. 
for who is able to govern this great people of yours? He is totally dependent on God. So as a baseline, as a qualifier for seeking wisdom, are you thankful? Are you humble? Are you desperate? And are you dependent on God? Though that's how Solomon ap approached it. And then, so what is wisdom? The first verse on your, on your, on your main, main card, so give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. In a minute, God calls that wisdom. He says, because you asked for wisdom. What did he ask for? A, dis a discerning heart to distinguish between right and wrong. That's what wisdom is. We have a decision to make. What is right and what is wrong? So this is a nice story, right? <laughs> this, Solomon, this Solomon story. He got it right. He started out so right. How does it apply to us? How do we go after wisdom? Where do we get wisdom from? Well, Hutch mentioned it. James, Jesus' brother, tells us, second verse down, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without approach, and it will be given him. If we lack wisdom, all we have to do is ask God. If we approach him, thankfulness, humbleness, dependency on him, desperate, he's going to give us wisdom. How does he do it? How do we get wisdom? Okay, here, God is offering us wisdom if we just ask him. How do we get it? Well, I put three different ways down. Isaiah talks about one. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Did you ever experience that? Where you hear God's voice say, you know, Jesus tells us, my sheep know my voice. Now, I will tell you this, most times that voice is connected to his word. As we spend time in his word, we're told the Holy Spirit's going to recall that and tell us what to do. And so do you have that type of walking relationship with God? Our mission here is to encourage men on to a closer walk with God. And this is one of the results of doing that. You need wisdom, you can ask for it. And when you, when you ask for it, he'll whisper it to you. And what he'll use, Joshua 1 verse 8, we talked about it last week. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Talk about God's word. Think about God's word. Implement God's word and you'll be successful. He'll give you the wisdom to be successful. And then the third one, plans fall for lack of counsel. But with many advisors, they succeed. Do you have advisors in your life? Do you have a personal board of directors? Guys, we're wired to be independent. We're wired to lead. We're wired to say we got this. One of the reasons there's not a wisdom channel, one of the reasons people don't, aren't hungry to turn into wisdom is because we think we got this, right? I went to business school. I've got experience. I worked for this company, that company, that company. I've done this for many, many years. I don't need to ask anymore. If we get in that spot, we're not a man of wisdom. In everything, we should seek wisdom. Are we thankful? Are we humble? Are we desperate? Are we dependent? So let's look at four guys and take a look at what keeps us from wisdom and see maybe which one of these you relate to. Um, I went on a hunt for four guys and I thought, you know, I want to try to find some guys that maybe reflect me a little bit. Maybe I can see myself a little bit clearer if I see it in somebody else. Isn't that funny how that works? <laughs> so Nebuchadnezzar. You know the story of Nebuchadnezzar? The Israelites hated him. King of Babylon. He was their biggest threat. And then God, through Jeremiah, referred to him as my servant, Nebuchadnezzar. And the people of Israel went crazy. Are you kidding me? How can he be your servant? Pick America's biggest enemy 
and think of God as causing, call, naming that person his servant, and how would you feel about that? The Israelites, they were, they were threatened by Babylon, and Babylon did come just as Jeremiah told them was going to happen because they would not turn and obey. So he came and took them all captive. God gave him Daniel. God gave Nebuchadnezzar dreams. He let Nebuchadnezzar know that he is a part of history. He is a part of, what, of, of, of God's plan for how he was moving in mankind. The problem was, while well, Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged that, and in his head he realized, yes, there was this great God, and he said through his mouth, there is no God like the God of Israel. And he acknowledged all of that. He stood out before his kingdom and said, look what I have built. Look how great I am. And God had warned him in a dream that unless he turned and gave his heart to God and acknowledged that this was God, God was going to take him down. And as soon as he had said those words, he lost his mind. And for seven years, he was a madman. Naked, out with the animals, living outside. Daniel's taking care of the kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar is out in the forest beside himself, crazy in his mind. But then one day he comes to himself and look what he says. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Now this is the most powerful man in the world at this time. Then I praised the most high. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an, an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Nebuchadnezzar, like that, became a man of wisdom. So I look at this and I say, how much of Nebuchadnezzar is in me? Nebuchadnezzar was not humble. That was his problem. Common problem. Have you got to a place where you can say, God's in charge? It's him. It's for his glory. All right, Solomon, turn the page over. Why did, so what, what's up with Solomon? Here's the guy who is, started like this, was given the opportunity to ask for anything. And he said, I'm like a kid. This kingdom's too big for me. Give me insight so I know what's right and wrong. Help me lead these people. And God says, because you asked for wisdom, I'm going to give you more wisdom than any man who ever lived. And in addition to that, I'm going to give you the other things that you, that, that you may have asked for. You're going to be comfortable. You're going to be rich. There's going to be peace during your reign. So God blessed them greatly. But as we're going to find out as we get later on in this series, he didn't finish well until the very end. From his 50s into his 60s, he went sideways. How did that happen? Gail's question to me when we studied Solomon was, if that happened to him, what makes you think that won't happen to you, Ron? How can any one of us guys think that we're going to finish well, be assured we're going to finish well, What's the warning sign? What do we have to pay attention to? Where did Solomon blow it? Well, in Deuteronomy 17, we're not going to read it, but here's what Moses said when, he, when the children of Israel were going into the promised land. The day is going to come when you're going to want to, just like everybody else, you're going to want a king. Okay, so here's the rules. Do not take a king except for an Israelite. Okay? Your king has to be an Israelite. And then that king needs to pay attention to three things. Don't take a foreign wife and don't add wives. Don't go to Egypt and add a bunch of horses. And don't add to your treasury. Don't pile up gold. And that king should write this rule down in the presence of the scribes, write it on a piece of paper, and then every day he should read those rules to remind himself. Solomon never did that. There's not one time where it's recorded that Solomon did any of that. Solomon got to a point where he thought he was it, right? I mean, smartest guy in the world, plus he's given all the money, had no, no counselors, 
had no accountability, smarter than the average guy. So this rule, write this down in front of everybody and read it every single day, that's a rule for an average guy, right? That's a rule for an average king, but not us. I mean, not us, because we're business guys. We don't need simple rules like that. We're smarter, right? We got more gift. That's like for the average guy. And we can talk ourselves out of anything, and we can talk ourselves into anything. But God made it real simple. If Solomon had done this, he wouldn't have fell. So I ask myself, what rules do I not pay attention to? What are some of the disciplines that God wants us to have in our life that I take light because I think I got it? Because I'm pretty sharp. I can handle it. I can, I can outwit that, but work my way around that. I'll tell you this, in my career, I took that thinking on. I can, I can go there with those guys, brush that off. That won't get me. That's not going to take me down. I just need to do that right now. Solomon had started that way. We have to pay, the exception, pay attention to exceptions in our life. Because right at the very beginning, the first thing he did was he took Pharaoh's wife. We told not to do that. And he worshipped in some places where a whole lot of other people was worshipping that he should have stayed away from. And then it showed up big time later on. So, Nebuchadnezzar's problem wasn't humble. Solomon's problem, he wasn't desperate for God. Once God gave him that wisdom, he acted like he knew it all. <laughs> Didn't have to pay attention to God's words anymore. Where are we in that, okay? Hezekiah, interesting story in Isaiah 39. Here's a guy, king of Israel, good king, took out foreign worship, led the children of Israel well, Isaiah comes to him and says, hey, Hezekiah, God told me to tell you to get your stuff together. He's taking you home. And Hezekiah said, whoa, what? And Hezekiah got before God and pleaded with him, please let me live. I don't want to die. I, I, I want to live longer. Let me have this kingdom longer. Let me rule longer. Let me live longer. So God says, I hear you. I'm giving you 15 more years. So what does Hezekiah do with those 15 years? <laughs> He's, <laughs> if you read the story, what he, what he ends up doing in his kingdom is he starts, he builds a palace for himself that's incredible. Waterfalls and water ducks. And he just, he took all of his resources and made his life extremely comfortable. I've only got this much time left. I'm going out comfortable, right? I'm going to build this great life for myself. And that's, that's what he did. Babylon heard about this, this palace he built, and they want to come see it. So they send an embassy in. And they leave. Isaiah comes, hey, who, who are those guys? Well, they were from Babylon, and, and they wanted to see what I built here. Well, what did you show them? I showed them. What else did you show them? I showed them my treasure, all the gold we got, everything we got. And Isaiah says to him, you idiot. <laughs> Babylon's going to come and take all of that. They're going to take your sons. After you die, they're taking your sons, and you're going to turn them into eunuchs. And they'll serve in Babylon. You know what Hezekiah said? That's good news. <laughs> so what you're saying is during my life, no, this is going to happen, right? <laughs> I'm good, right? <laughs> so this happened after I die? Well, that's good news, Isaiah. How did we get there? How do we get there where we, where, where we no longer think that what happens after us matters? I tell you right now, there's a, guy, there's a business that we, we were looking at to buy. I met with the owner, and uh, he's built himself a nice business. I asked him, what's going to happen to your business after you die? He said, what do I care? I'm gone. <laughs> what do I care? <laughs> he's got his son that's on cocaine. He just checked out. But we got to pay attention as we get closer to retirement age. It can, we can turn our attention real easy, guys, just onto ourselves and make it life comfortable here and forget the fact that this is going like that, too, and what we're really going to is somewhere there. So, all right, Hezekiah's problem, he was no longer thankful. He was no longer thankful to God. 
and he wasn't in a place with his purpose of doing it for God's glory and serving other people. His passion became for just comfort for himself. All right, last one is Job. Here's a guy that took a, the biggest loss of probably anybody in the Bible of all time, right? But what was Job's response? Thankful, still humble, still desperate, still dependent. Here's what he said, but where, where can wisdom come, can be found? Where does understanding dwell? Man does not, know, does not know its value, nor is it found in the land of the living. God understands its way. He knows its place. Paul says it like this. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable. Wisdom comes from God. God offers to us if we just ask him. Our part in that, be thankful, be humble, be, be, be dependent, be desperate. Be in his word, be hungry for him, and he will give us wisdom. Because we're studying this, my antennas that were up a little bit more. Okay, so this week I was asked, I kept asking myself, how many times am I asking for help? I had four conversations with my son this week about stuff he has to decide on. Do you know who he comes to? Me. And so my question was, are you also going to God? <laughs> are you? Okay, am I? When I have to do, when, am I, who am I throwing it by? Where's the first place that you go to? Proverbs 4, verse 7 says this. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Though it cost all you have, get understanding. Is wisdom your priority? Where do you first go to when you're not sure what to do? Who are we searching for? Is there any blockage between you and the God who gives wisdom? Okay, table leaders take it from here and we'll be back a little bit later. guys let's pull it together so question for you question is this is knowledge wisdom is knowledge wisdom no definitely not one of the guys at our table will tell you it's definitely not because his kid came home from college with a whole lot of knowledge and thought he knew everything <laughs> But do we sometimes think knowledge is, is wisdom? When you first look for advice on something, do you go some, to someone who has knowledge on it? Or are you searching out for someone who might have wisdom, discerning, knowing right from wrong, connected with God's view on how things are done? So I think sometimes our tendency can be to do, do that, right? Just go to where there's knowledge. Go to where, where somebody knows facts on things. And the, what we have to get to is what is the heart of it. It's amazing how God can give examples of that and, and put things in your life in me. Look what happened to Solomon. So he asked for wisdom. He asked to, for discernment to do right from wrong. God said, I'm going to give that to you. And then what happens is these two ladies show up on his doorstep, right? Two prostitutes that were living together. Both had babies. One rolled on top of her baby and suffocated it. And then she, in the night, took her baby and put it on the other, by the other prostitute and took the other prostitute's baby because she wanted to have the baby. And so they end up in front of Solomon, and the real mother says, she took my baby. And she said, no, this is my baby. And so Solomon looked at him. There's no way of doing blood tests back then, DNA tests. But what does God give Solomon? Wisdom and discernment and how to figure out what the truth is. Bring me a sword. And he says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm gonna, I don't know what else to do. I'm going to cut this baby in half, and you each get half. 
And the fake mom says, that's reasonable. And the real mom says, she can have it. And Solomon knew whose baby it was, right? <laughs> and so this, things like that are available to us. And isn't it exciting when it happens? There have been times in my life, as I'm sure it is in your life, that you can relate to where the option was one and two. What do I do? One or two, one or two. And you say, God, help me. Please help me. And you're desperate, you're humble, and you're desperate. And all of a sudden, he gives you option three. And it comes out of nowhere, and it makes total sense. You go, where did that come from? And he just gave you wisdom because you asked. That is what God offers us every single day. What we have to grasp onto is that knowledge is good and knowledge is fine, but knowledge isn't wisdom. And so the thing we have to pursue, the thing that's so valuable, the thing that's worth chasing, the thing that Solomon says, go after this. This is worth more than anything else. Is that, does it say, that relationship with God, give me wisdom for living. So when I don't know what to do, I turn to you and you make it evident. And he whispers to us, and he does it through his word, and he does it through counsel, and he does it through people around us. But he does it, and we can live life that way. That's what our God offers us. As long as we have relationship with him, that's not broken. As long as we're in a place of thankfulness and humbleness and dependency and desperation for him, he's going to give us that. He wants to shine through us. He wants to be glorified through us. So he puts us in positions where we have to be desperate for him, and then he is willing to show up. If you've been stuck somewhere, is it because you have figured it out, because you're fighting in a knowledgeable way to try to squirm your way or work your way out of it? And maybe you should be just turning to wisdom and let him show you option number three which can can come from anywhere. Probably the better question on the table today could have been, and I I wish I would have put it on the card, was when have you experienced a time when God showed up like that for you and gave you wisdom where it came out of, wow, where was that? And I know we all have stories like that. So what God offers us is, do you remember the first time you were ever on an airplane? I do. I was 22 years old, believe it or not, going on an airplane. (laughs) First time I ever was on an airplane. But I remember you're 30,000 feet up. What do you see when you look down? It's like grids. It's like everything's laid out and you can see how everything flows. When we're down here, we don't see all that, right? So what God offers us when we ask wisdom is to pick us up and help us to see life from 30,000 feet. So, oh, that's the way to go. I can see that. Yeah, that's it. And he gives us that. That's how God sees it. He knows all that. And that is available to us. So... What's wisdom? Discernment for doing right and wrong. Where do we get it from? From him. How do we get it? We ask. And along the way, he may use a few people. So search out wise people and get counsel from them. I had to make a decision. I knew, I asked God for wisdom. I knew what the answer was. I didn't like the answer. So I asked somebody in our industry, High powered in our industry. What do you think about this? Do you think I should do this or this? He dropped the F bomb and told me what to do. <laughs> That's what I wanted to do, what he told me. That's what I would have liked to do. But in my heart, I knew, absolutely knew. That's wrong. And all he did was make it more evident because it was so selfish when I heard it from him that I left there just saying, God, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for making that even that much more clear to me. I'm sorry I even asked him the question. You already gave me the answer. So, guys, pay attention, okay? Pay attention to what we have and just check your own barometer on how hungry you are for this. We need to be men who seek wisdom. Then we'll be influential men. Then we'll be powerful men. Then we'll be men who make a difference in our families, in our life, in our business, in our community and shine for God during this little bit of time that he's given us here. All right, here's where we're going with this series. We're going to take a break. Um, we've, got, uh, we've got a convention to go to and a few other things. So I think we're going to do six weeks on Solomon. Um, there's one more week when it's still pretty good for Solomon. The Queen of Sheba shows up. That's worth unpacking together. And then we're going to go three weeks on what happened to Solomon, okay? <laughs> and there's some good lessons on that. But, but Kutch is coming back next week with another look another uh, look in, eight, in Romans 8, Apex. Uh, so we'll do that next week. Chris Freiberg is then going to do two weeks 
uh, men at work. Uh, what's our challenge at work? What's our problem? What's the, what's the opportunity that we have at work? Uh, Hutch is going to come back yet with another week, and then we'll pick up with Solomon for a few more weeks in the spring. Uh, so that's kind of where we're headed. All right. Uh, break at your tables. Appreciate you, and we'll see you in a few weeks. All right. One Thing for Men meets at Cabernet Steakhouse in Alfreda, Georgia, on Friday mornings from 7 to 8 a.m. If you live in the Atlanta area or visit the area on Friday, we would love to have you join us in person. And if you have been blessed by this message, please consider supporting One Thing for Men online.